Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Paul. Let's pray. Father, open up our hearts and minds, Lord. You, you are a great God, and you love us with a great, perfect love, and you know us better than we know ourselves. So help us, Lord. Help us. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Get me completely out of the way. No one needs to hear from me. Everyone needs to hear from you. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Is this not Joseph's son? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind. Remember Jesus says everyone who sins is a slave to sin. He has come to set the prisoner free. Praise God. Liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? You know, I always thought Jesus was going to make, make it in this world. I, I remember him when he was three years old. I always told people that he was going to be awesome. Well, I knew that before you did. No, you didn't. No. I've known Mary and Joseph longer than anybody here. I knew Jesus was going to make something. I've been telling everyone that. I've been telling everyone that. Yeah. The calm before the storm. If you have your Bibles, keep looking. And Jesus said to them, this is verse 23. <laughs> Doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, my hometown folks, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years, six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. And then he, this happens, when they heard these things, Again, these are the people saying, isn't he wonderful? I love his gracious words. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with what? Wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff. People are a little fickle. But passing through their midst, he went away. The calm before the storm. And I actually changed this uh, title. It's actually the calm before the storm before the calm. The calm before the storm before the calm. See, Jesus, until he began his ministry, you know, was peaceful, gracious, kind, and then he started preaching, and the storm came. And look at some of the things our Lord said. Read this with me. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that it works are evil. Its works are evil. The storm from the world. This is why the world hated Jesus. And so many in the world hate to listen to him now. Because he points out our sin. He points out the fact that we're all evil. Loved by God, but evil. The storm from the world. The storm from the religious leaders. Jesus is speaking. I know that you are offspring of Abraham. You, you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. These religious leaders were so arrogant, so self-righteous, so closed off that God himself incarnate speaking to them, they had no room in their heart for his word. None. Now, we know all we need to know. The Lord's like, that's why you want to kill me. 
you won't even let me into your heart. But there are more storms. The storm from demons. Demons. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And Jesus comes into the synagogue and the man cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So, who's speaking here, the man or the demon? The demon. Look at that. Who, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Maybe the demon is trying to make this man think that he's part of him and it's never going to be any different, and so the two are one. And then he says, I, I know who you are. I know the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out. You see, we're fish in a barrel to Satan and demons and evil. You can try as hard as you want. You're not going to get any better. But the name of Jesus has infinite power over all the darkness. And Jesus says, be quiet, come out. Let Jesus speak to the darkness in your life. Let him speak to the worries, the fears, the anger, the regret, the shame, the guilt. Let Jesus speak to that, see what happens. Amen? The calm before the storm, the storm from the demons. And then there was even... The lack of faith storm from his closest friends. The people that he loved the most. I mean, he loved everyone the same, but they loved him the most. They're with him. And the night he is arrested, Peter answers Jesus, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away, Lord. I, not me. Not me. I'm much stronger in faith than they are. Mm hmm. And Jesus answers him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. That's why we have the rooster out there etched into the concrete. Don't ever deny Jesus and what he's done. No matter what else, never deny what Jesus has done in our lives. Peter said to him, even, I'm, if, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you, Right? And all the disciples said the same. And Jesus doesn't argue. He's like, I'm just telling you. I'm not arguing with you. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. And again, remember, they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit yet. They didn't have the power to stand up against all that fear. But once they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and they were not counting on their own power anymore, but the, the, the power of Jesus in them, they never ran again. They never ran again. And Peter... The one who denied him three times, Peter was crucified upside down because he asked the people who executed him that he did not deserve to die the way his Savior had died. And so they actually flipped him upside down and killed him that way. This is the total transformation of the human soul from trying to do things on our own to surrendering our lives and being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Infinite power and love. The calm before the storm, before the calm. On the cross, Luke 23. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. John has different last words from Jesus. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. The calm before the storm, before the calm. And on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. 
Before Jesus was taken to heaven, he said this, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, you will have trouble. Jesus promises us we're going to have a lot of hard times in this life. Okay? Just because you can be a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that everything's going to be. No, actually, things are going to get tougher in many ways. Because now, guess what? Now Jesus is giving you his heart. You start, you're going to start caring about other people before you wouldn't even give them the time of day to. Because now it's Jesus' heart in you. And you're learning to love everyone. And we learn to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. And our world gets so much bigger than it ever was before we surrendered and submitted. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Past tense, right? I have already overcome it. I've already overcome it. How? Through his blood. He's already paid the price for all of our sins. It's a done deal. Once you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, be at peace. The calm before the storm, before the calm. The calm, the peace that passes all understanding. And think about that. Once we have accepted Christ, we stop trying to earn our own way into heaven. I mean, if I try to earn my way to heaven, that's hell. Because I can't do it and I'm going to be punished forever. When I accept his salvation, his blood on the cross for me, my sins are completely wiped out. They have been completely paid for. And now I have peace. Whether I live or whether I die, I'm his. And let me tell you, once we're not afraid to die, why would we be afraid to live? I mean really live. Like loving everybody. Like getting out of our comfort zone and reaching out to people with that love and that grace and that forgiveness. Really care about people. Really listen to them. Really live. Ugh. The calm before the storm before the calm. And I don't know you, but I, I, I'm, the more I get to... You know, here are your stories. Many of our lives have followed this same pattern. The calm before the storm, before the calm. The calm is childhood. It's childhood. You don't see a lot of four-year-olds with ulcers. They're just, they're just living, right? Laughing, playing. They get in fights, yeah, but they get over it. They don't hold on to stuff for 20 years, amen? Amen. So as children, and I know some of you had really rough childhoods, so you, maybe you didn't even have that calm, and I'm really sorry about that. Maybe you didn't even have calm when you were a child. But a lot of us can look back at our childhood and say, that was, that was a pretty calm, pretty calm time. But then the storm came. And the storm is becoming aware of the sin in ourselves, others, and the entire world, that this is not heaven this is a really broken, dark place in many ways. And the storm starts to come. And I don't know if there's a difference in men and women, boys and girls, but it seemed like our daughter kind of learned this before our sons did. I remember, I think she was like maybe five. And, you know, there were kids everywhere outside. I'm out working in my garage or whatever. And she comes over and she's just weeping. I said, Sweet, sweetheart, what's wrong? And she said, the, the, the girls said that they're not going to be my friend today. Oh, my goodness, that hurts me at, as old as I am now. Ladies, I don't know, I think you can be meaner than guys. Amen? <laughs> guys, we just sort of find out. We're not going to be your friend today. Yeah. I'm like, really? Oh, that hurts. <laughs> the storm begins. The storm. And the more we're aware of the world, the older we get, the more we realize, wow, wow. There's so much darkness. We can be so immensely evil and mean to each other. I mean, it's almost, I mean, we're not infinite beings, but it's almost infinite how evil we can be to one another. It's astonishing. I'll tell you what, if you want to live in the storm, watch the news. 
all the time. You just be in a storm the whole life. Anxious, worried, afraid. That's not God's will for us. The calm before the storm. Yeah, there is a great deal of sin in this world. That's, and Jesus tells us the truth. He told us the truth. That's why he says, you are a light in the darkness. Don't be surprised by the darkness. People who don't know Jesus are living in darkness. They're trying the best they know how, but they have not, they have not received his grace yet. And so they're angry and they're frustrated and they're afraid and they feel guilt and shame and they take it out on everybody else around them. Okay? All right? You see, there is sin and it's everywhere. And there are some important aspects to this sin. I want to kind of walk through this with you. The penalty of sin, the pollution of sin, the peace when we surrender our sins to Jesus and that leads to humility before God and compassion for others who don't know Jesus yet and are in that sin world, that darkness. But first, the penalty of sin for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God, that we accept his grace. We stop trying to prove ourselves. We stop trying to defend ourselves. We stop trying to quiet that spirit of condemnation within us that says we're failing and we're not good enough and we'll never be good enough. And we just give it all to Jesus. Say, you know what? I'm a sinner through and through. And this is how much I'm worth. This is how much he loves me. That's my identity. Not in what I do, not in how good a job I do as a husband or a father or my work or whatever. My identity is in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. That's who I am. The penalty of sin, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. The pollution of sin. Jesus says, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I mean, the pollution of sin, it's just we're slaves. We're, you know, the, the fear and the guilt and the anger and the, the self-hatred and the regret and just all of that darkness. I mean, and, and how do people deal with that without Jesus? I mean, look at the world, how people deal with this individual sin. I'm, I'm pretty good at looking at the sin in the world and the sin in other people. But man, when I start looking at the sin in me, whew, when you're quiet, alone, and you really consider your life, guess what? You're not alone. Jesus is there too. And he says, I know it all. I know all of it. And I love you more than you'll ever know. I want to set you free from that darkness. I want to set you free from that guilt. I want to set you free from that fear. This is not God's will. This is the whole reason I came. Jesus said he didn't come for people who think they are righteous, but for those who know they are sinners and want to turn around. They want a new life. They're tired. Well, thank you, Jesus. The pollution of sin goes everywhere. The calm before the storm, before the calm. The peace when we surrender our sins to Jesus. I mean, he paid for them, right? So who owns my sin? He paid for it. How many of you think it's a good idea that I give him my sins? No, I'm going to hold on to this sin. Why would you do such a thing? Give it to him. It belongs to him. Let him set you free with his love, with his grace with his plan for your life. Give up your plan. I don't know about you, my plan was all about me. It was about comfort, making a lot of money, being pretty well known. It was pretty small and petty and sm it was all about me. That was my plan. The Lord's like, wow, that's quite a plan you have there, Mo. Hmm. I got a better plan. I got the plan that you've been created to live, but it means giving it up. It means surrendering control. It means getting back to that childlike faith. Saying, what are we doing today? Dad, what are we doing today, Mom? Come on. And Jesus said that, right? He said, unless you become like children, not only will you not see heaven, you won't even enter it. So we start out in that calm as children, and then we go into the storm, 
and it really starts raging when we become teenagers, right? I mean, being a teenager is rough. Trying to conform to everybody but wanting to be yourself too, and just, man, teenagers can be mean. And then you get, the sooner we can surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and let him just love us as we are. The calm before the storm, before the calm. The peace that passes understanding. The peace when we surrender our sins to Jesus. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If I say I'm not a sinner, I am just lying to myself. And that's the worst kind of lie, self-deception. And who benefits from that anyway? I mean, everybody in my life knows I'm a sinner. The only one who thinks that I'm perfect is me. So ask the closest person to you, do you think I'm perfect? Um, wow. No. We still love you, though, just the way you are. If we confess our sins, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so tired of being angry. I'm so tired of judging everybody and letting myself just skate. I'm so sick of that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And again, his, not, his word is not in us. This very same thing Jesus accused the religious leaders of, your, my word has no room in you. When I am saying I'm not a sinner, his word has no room in me. But once his word gets into me, he sets me free. Thank you, Jesus. See, to me, it's like a huge rubber band, right? And that tension, I mean, we, we, we get further and further away, and then it just wham, pulls us back, pulls us back to him. And so we thank God for that. I mean, whatever that was for you, maybe the first time that really broke you, I mean, really broke you, and said, I'm so tired of doing this alone, and I'm ready to give God a chance. Praise God for whatever it was that broke you the first time. I mean, I look back on my life, and the first time I was really broken was when I was 18, surrendered my life to Jesus. When I was 20, I I just felt like he was calling me into ministry, so I surrendered my life again. When I was 24, Lynn and I had been married for a year, and it was a Donnybrook that first year. Oh, my goodness, we fought all the time. And God dealt with me, and he broke me again. Right? Brought me back to him. When I was 35, I was ready to leave the ministry. I was completely broken. The Lord's like, I don't want you to leave, but we need to do this different. When I was about 41, the church board fired micromanaging Mo. They said, your services are no longer needed. (laughs) We're we're going in a different direction. A Holy Spirit-led church. How about that? And I said to the board, I'm like, I don't even know. Half my time is going to meetings. What am I supposed to do? They said, we don't know. Go and find out. Go and find out. Go and spend time with the Heavenly Father and pray. And that's when everything really began here. That's when all these miracles just started happening. Transformed lives. Service like we've never seen before. Joy in the Lord. And he gets all the credit. He gets all the glory. Praise God. And see, the thing is that, especially as we get into Bible studies, and, and I would encourage you, you know, this is why we pr- um, provide this, this sheet in your, in your bulletin. I mean, just sit down by yourself, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sit down and spend time with Jesus or with your family, whatever, but get into his word. The more you are in his word and his word is in you, the more he will show you when that rubber band starts getting stressed. You don't have to wait for it to get dangerous. He'll start showing you when you're going into anger or judgment or greed or self-hatred. You'll just feel that. The Holy Spirit will show it to you. Right? I mean, we've probably all, all heard that we are called to hate the sin but love the sinner. Amen? Amen? I think before we give our lives to Jesus, at least my experience is, I love the sin and hate the sinner. I love the sin. But I don't really like people. Right? Think about it. Isn't that what jealousy is? Mm. 
what is that guy doing with that new car? I'm a better person than he is. I can't, I can't even stand him. But I love that car. Isn't jealousy, loving the sin, the materialism, whatever it is, but hating people? I think so. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ and his spirit starts living in us and through us, we realize everybody's a sinner. That's not a big thing. We just We forgive each other. We're patient with each other. We pray for each other. But we love each other. We love each other. And Jesus has already paid the price for the sin. So what are we going to focus on? The cross of Christ. Penalty of sin, pollution of sin. The cross of Christ provides infinite power over all sins, allowing everyone to surrender their sins and be set free. That one event, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. His work is done. It's all paid for. All of it. His infinite power on the cross to forgive everyone. We just have to surrender. That's it. Just surrender. The calm before the storm. Before the calm. And then the peace when we surrender our sins. Humility before God. How good he is to me. What he has done for me. I owe him everything. I owe him my entire life. I owe him every day. Humility before God and compassion for other people, especially those who don't know Jesus Christ yet. Can you imagine what that's like? Have you tried living your life with, without Jesus? Remember what that's like. And you may say to yourself, you know what, Mo, you're, you're not much of a sinner compared to me. I'm, I beg to differ. We could sit down and have a cup of coffee. We compare our sins. But even if you're right, even if you have done much worse things than I have done, then that means God has forgiven you even more and loves you even more. Then he loves me. And that produces a greater sense of humility before God and a greater compassion for people who are going through precisely what you have gone through. The most self-righteous people are the ones who have forgotten how sinful they were before too. So God can take my sin and turn it to humility before him and compassion before others. The calm before the storm before the calm. And one of the great storms in our lives, I think it's the greatest storm of all, is fear. Uh, the Bible says over 366 times, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Fear. Second Timothy 1, 7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And can't you just feel that rubber band when you're starting to get afraid, right? That tension, that anxiety, that, right? The fear. But that's not from God. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. And three examples I'd like to lift up today. The coronavirus, a young man at Chandler Healthcare, and our beautiful niece. Coronavirus. I'm going to die from coronavirus. Really? You're not. You're not. And even if you do, how many of you realize each of us is going to die here? If you came in here not realizing that, you need to wake up. It's going to happen, right? Matter of fact, we're not even promised tomorrow. The question is not, are we going to die? The question is this, if I die today, am I ready? That's the question. Am I ready right now? Have I made peace with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Have I accepted his gift of salvation? Because then whether I live or whether I die, I'm his. There's nothing to worry about. In many ways, the day that he calls us home is going to be our best day. Think about it. No more of this evil, this darkness, this anger, this hatred, this self-loathing, this worry, this fear. I mean, we don't want to rush it, but oh my goodness. How beautiful it will be to see our Lord and Savior face to face. We fall asleep here, we wake up there, and he says, welcome home. And we can express our love to him face to face. So do we panic? No, about anything. As followers of Jesus, we don't panic. We thank him for his love, that he is here with us. There's nothing to worry about. We feel, if you're worrying, 
worry about nothing, pray about everything, say, Lord Jesus, show us what you want us to do. We pray for our world leaders. We pray for the, the people in, in medicine to find whatever they need to find. We pray for people to remain safe. We pray for those who are sick to be healed. And we pray for those who may be uh, dying that they will open their hearts to Jesus Christ and accept him. We pray that for all people. But we don't panic. We don't panic. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love and a sound mind now this young man at Chandler Healthcare I love him his name is Ricky he says that when he gets out of there he's coming here and he's a little bit older than I thought I thought he was like 25 26 looks really young I find the older I get I'm just no good with ages just not at all just not at all right but he has he has three girls and he's got a fiance as well and he you know, he, he got involved in drugs and all, and, and it, it really, it almost killed him. Talk about that wake-up call, right? He said, a lot of guys have done a lot less than me and are no longer here. Okay, all right. Well, I guess God's not done with you yet. You have work to do, right? This Thursday, I get a text from him saying, I was sitting and waiting for worship, and then I realized today's Thursday. Worship is on Friday. <laughs> so they're just so excited. I texted them back. That's the kind of enthusiasm for worship I love to see. Amen. But on Tuesday at a Bible study, and I got to tell you, we're just seeing so many. Yesterday morning, I think we had 20 men show up for Bible study. What God is doing is we have like five guys who don't even come to this church who are in Bible studies during the week with us. What God is doing in this place is just, it's just beyond beautiful. But on Tuesday, Ricky told us, he said, you know what, I was, um, I was thinking that I wanted to get out of here as quickly as possible. He said, but I gotta, I need to stay here. I need to get strong physically and I need to get strong spiritually for my family. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You get in the word, you stay in the word, you let God grow you up, mature you. We are not boys with toys. We are men of God. And there is work to do. And we are women of God, and there is work to do. In a world where there is just such juvenile behavior, almost everywhere you look, we need mature followers of Jesus Christ who realize we owe him everything and we We'll die for him if that's what it takes for the world to know how much he loves them. And so I praise God for this young man. Like I say, when he gets out at the right time, he's going to be here with his fiance and with his three beautiful daughters, a place of grace where we are all sinners and all loved. Amen. And then our niece. So um, I get a call from my mom on Friday, and she's in tears. And she tells me what's going on with our niece. Our niece is in the hospital, and they come to find out she had, and I didn't even know this was a thing, foreign accent syndrome, FAS. It's a medical condition in which patients develop speech patterns that are perceived as a foreign accent. It's an actual real thing that is different from their native accent without having acquired it in the perceived accent's place of origin. It usually results from a stroke. It can also develop from head trauma, migraines, and she has a lot of headaches, or developmental problems. The condition might, also, uh, might occur due to lesions in the speech production network of the brain or may also be considered a neuropsychiatric condition. The condition was first reported in 1907, and listen to this, between 1941 and 2009, there were only 62 recorded cases. So Friday, at school, she's sitting there in class, and something starts happening in her mind. And it actually changes. And she's speaking with a British accent, a really strong British accent, and my mom is just terrified. And I got pretty scared, too. Right? And I said, well, I'll pray for her. I'll pray for her. I'll pray for her. Right? I'll pray for her. She's in the hospital. My mom had talked to her, and she said she could hardly even understand her. She had to have her repeat what she was saying, slow down, so she could understand this beautiful young lady, this 20-year-old. Right? And um, I told my mom, I'll pray for her. 
And I hung up the phone, and the Lord told me, you call her right now. And I said, no. Why? Because I'm afraid. As a pastor, I'm telling you, there are so many things I deal with that I've never had to deal with before. Completely out of my depth. But I'm learning that God wants to show me how God has not given us a spirit of fear. Lay that aside. He's given us a spirit of power, love, sound mind. And the Lord spoke to me and just, just you know, to my heart. And he said, look, if you're afraid to talk to her, imagine how terrified she is. Yes, Lord. So I called her. And it was a really heavy accent. And we talked for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I had to have her repeat all kinds of things. But I said, okay, well, I'm going to pray for you. What, what do you want me to pray? She said that when I go to sleep tonight, that when I wake up in the morning, it'll be gone. I'll be back to my normal voice. I said, okay. So we prayed. <clears throat> The next morning, yesterday morning, I called her again because the Lord put it on my heart. Don't be afraid. You call her. You call her and love her and encourage her. And it's about halfway back from where it was. Okay? About halfway back. The healing is happening. But to me, that's an example. We all get afraid to reach out to people who are hurting. Lay that fear aside. Let God remind you you have all the power you need with Jesus you have all the love you need with Jesus, and he's going to work in your mind to say whatever you need to say. Lots of times you don't need to say anything, just letting him know you love him. That's all that's needed. The calm before the storm, before the calm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for not leaving us in the storm. Thank you for sending the perfect lamb, your son, our savior, into this darkness to shine the light of love and hope and faith and peace. Lord Jesus, just take over our lives right now. We surrender everything to you. And Lord, lead us to people who don't know you yet. Give us your love for them. And help us to understand whatever words need to be said, you'll give those to us at the right time too. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.